Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Today's episode is brought to you by Christian Focus Publications. Visit christianfocus.com to see the latest releases in theology, biblical studies, and reference books. Get 15% off by using the code Equipping in Grace, no spaces, all lowercase, at checkout. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have my friend Owen. Owen, welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me back, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, can you uh, catch us up on what's going on in your life, marriage, ministry, and what are you working on ministry project-wise? Yeah, um, I still have three kids, which is fantastic. I have one wife, so things are proceeding as I would hope there. And uh, yeah, uh, we're in a blessed season with our family. Very thankful for that. And um, just this last fall, in professional terms, I had a book come out called Reenchanting Humanity. So that was uh, that was about a four-year work in progress. Thankful that came out. And also this fall, uh, my friend Gavin Peacock and I, uh, who I know you've talked with as well, completed a trilogy uh, of three books, three short books that will come out in April 2020, just a few months away, uh, on what the Bible teaches about lust, homosexuality, and transgenderism. So um, it's been a full and uh, not boring season, and I'm really thankful for it and for God's blessing on my undeserving self. Mm, amen brother amen he definitely uses you i know it i see it and i'm i'm just very thankful for it too so can you, you thank you Dave. Mm-hmm, for sure brother can you uh tell us about your book re-enchanting humanity a theology for mankind why you wrote it and how it's being received yeah i wrote it because uh there aren't a lot of anthropologies out there doctrines of humanity that is if you're assigning one for example at the seminary level maybe an mdiv survey class um the one you might reach to uh in a reform sense is hokum was created in god's image and it's a strong book a, a very helpful book but it's it's more than three decades old and so it doesn't necessarily cover a lot of our modern issues so i wanted to go deep in uh, a biblical doctrine of humanity in this book but then i also wanted to put the modern questions of our time uh, into conversation with the scripture. So I have chapters on things like sexuality, race, justice, technology, and so on and so forth. So trying to do two things, really. Number one, uh, take readers deep in the doctrine of humanity from scripture. And then number two, uh, try to raise, and as best as I can, answer some of the prevailing questions of the age of our time. Uh, so that's that's the burden of the book and, and my work in it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really helpful, helpful book. I... I really enjoyed how how biblical it is. I know that's a weird thing to say, but it's it's you can't take that for granted anymore. It's just thoroughly saturated in scripture. It's helpful in in the best sense of the word and um, everything that I, uh, well, everything I expect from your writing, Owen. So thank you for that. Well, that's kind. I think basically the best thing about a book that I would write that one could say would be that it would be biblical. So I, I, I am very thankful for that. You know, the best ideas there are out there. Uh, I have not had, and frankly, no human person has had. <laughs> um, God has revealed to us in his infinite wisdom grounded in his aseity and so i uh yeah i I love scripture i love scripture not because i'm a a virtuous person inherently but because you know god has saved me and given me a love for his word and so I, i love reading in lots of different areas um i love reading books of all different kinds and learning from authors of of varying perspectives even but when it comes time you know to to try and give people a foundation for life there is simply nothing like scripture. It is God breathed and it is beautiful. And it, it frankly goes beyond our expectations of it. I mean, part of what I try to do in Reenchanting Humanity is quote uh, a number of different genres of scripture and, uh, and go to different places 
in the canon, depending on the, the issue in question, to ground my argument for the doctrine. So, you know, I want to be in the prophets, in other words. I want to be a narrative. I want to reference Hannah's story. I want to talk about Ruth. You know, I want to talk about the Gospels. Certainly want to reference Peter and Paul and others. So anyway, Scripture is it's, it's such a symphonic book with so many different voices, so many different parts, all, all telling one story, uh, that my hope is that the book communicates something of that love for the Word of God. So Definitely, definitely. That's really well said. Why is anthropology the major issue of the 21st century? I think it follows on the heels of um, the discussion about the death of God in the 20th century. Uh, Nietzsche famously introduces this idea, meaning it in his own personal way, and yet the death of God comes to be taken literally, basically, as the 20th century unfolds, such that we're left with basically what you could call nihilistic religion, where people continue to meet in religious communities, but they do not believe in any actual being that is God. If you follow that kind of trajectory, and you trace it out logically, you have to recognize that the next target after God is going to be man is going to be humanity, because God and man are inextricably bound, uh, according to Scripture. In other words, just after God creates the heavens and the earth, he creates the image of God, the imago Dei, humankind. The man, of course, being made first, the woman being made from the man. And so, when we're talking about our age, and we're talking about all these different anthropological questions, we have to recognize that really what they boil down to is the death of humanity. In other words, the loss of any fixed meaning uh, of what the human person is and is to be. People around us, if we can get out of kind of philosophical categories and philosophical language for a minute here, people all around us, Dave, have no idea what it means to be a human person. I, I, I don't mean, you know, high-flown thinkers on the local university campus. I mean flesh and blood people. Um, our kids who go to public schools, let's say, in some cases, or are in secular colleges and universities. There's a lot of good people working in those settings, and we're thankful for that. And yet, we have to recognize that the prevailing mode and body of ideas in public education, or in secular education, as you will, it is not one that is received from Scripture, and that uh, uh, represents the traditional understanding of the human person, you could call it that. It's one that is a new understanding of humanity, where we are essentially a bundle of feelings and desires and inclinations where we don't have anything fixed about our identity, where there is no telos uh, to which we are traveling as human people, where we do not have moral duties and theological obligations to God, where there is no true problem of sin that is not just a generic problem or a systemic problem, but is first and foremost our problem individually before God. We are guilty before him and in danger of everlasting damnation. None of these things are true, and thus we don't need a savior. And we certainly don't need uh, God to become man. Uh, and and, and die for us as the, the true God, the true man, uh, Jesus the Christ. And so all this to say, Christians need to recognize that people around us are learning a new understanding of humanity and are understanding from it that they create their identity. Identity is not given by God. And that is causing massive chaos uh, in the West today. Yeah, that's that's really well said. You know, we're, we're talking about, you just talked about how it's causing massive chaos, and here's one issue that, that is definitely causing chaos and causing problems. You know, Darwinism is crippling generation after generation in our public schools. It's leading many teenagers and college students to abandon the Christian faith. How can pastors and parents uh, team up to help their teens and college students develop a biblical worldview that stands against evolution and for a biblical worldview? First, it happens through the training of children in the home. Uh, I read a stat recently that said that the average father or mother converses with their child on a weekly basis about meaningful topics for roughly five minutes. In other words, in a given week in which there are 168 hours, the average father or mother talks for five minutes with their child about meaningful things. Now, it's easy to hear a stat like that and think, oh, those terrible parents out there. Uh, in reality, you have to recognize, look, life is fast moving and challenging and it's not easy to be a father or mother and there's all sorts of things happening and you get home from work and you're tired and the kids are tired and, and it's not easy to gather people together uh, and have a father lead the family and 
family worship, family devotions a uh, few times a week. These things don't come easily. It's very much like like the individual fight for faith in the individual Christian life, right? We don't we don't drift into holiness as individual Christian men and women, do we? And in the same way, a family does not drift uh, toward the Lord. There has to be this dogged determination that the family is going to, to be centered in the Word of God, which in practical terms means we're going to lead our children into the truth. We're going to train them in the truth. We're going to have set-apart times, and they don't have to be long and drawn out, but we're going to have set-apart times where we read the Word of God together and talk about it and pray. And then we're going to try to do that kind of Deuteronomy 6 modeling of Christianity, and, and not only modeling, but answering questions as they come when you're driving in the car to gymnastics practice or band practice or whatever it may be. So first and foremost, Dave, I would just love to see Christian fathers and mothers, and thankfully many of them do this, but love to see many more do this, and there's a greater need for this uh, as our culture secularizes, disciple their kids, both, again, in the formal and in the informal sense, and then also ground their children in the life of the local church, because uh, I do not see the local church is that which a parent can effectively hand their child over to uh, and say, okay, you disciple my child, and that parent abdicate the responsibility of discipleship. That's that's not good at all. Uh, that's a total misunderstanding, as I was just talking about, of what it means to be a biblical father or mother captivated by the gospel of grace. And yet, as a father and mother, as, the, as a husband and wife team led by the man, are seeking to train kids in the Christian faith, in the home, they are totally right to take their kids to a strong local church and thus see that local church as a major partner in the discipleship of their children. And so that then we have all sorts of things to say about ecclesiology and strong expository preaching and communication of the gospel and uh, reformed worldview that sees all of life is under God's dominion and for God's glory, and, and there's much more we could say. But those are some things I think we need to say in answer to your good question. Yeah, that that's really good. I think one thing that you, you touched on family devotions, I think one practical way, and, and I often talk with guys, they think, oh, well, I have to open the Bible. And, and yes, you do. But one of the things that my wife loves to do is she just likes to have theological conversation. And uh, your Christian wife wants to have theological conversation with you. And for you to listen to her and, and not, to, especially if you have a Bible and seminary education, I've been guilty of this and had to grow in this myself. Uh, she doesn't want you to to just, you know, blow by the questions. She wants you to give an answer and explain things and then let her talk. Like my wife is incredibly intelligent and, and, but uh, sometimes I'm, I, she's like, you answered the question and you're already five, five like steps beyond like the question. So we have to, we have to slow down and, you know, recognize, hey, uh, yes, answer questions. Yes, be and train and, and be a, be a, a good preach sound doctrine, but uh, but also be loving and intentional in that. Yeah, and that's what Deuteronomy six I think is calling for. It's not a child, for example, in that context, you know, raising a question and then just just some kind of quick shorthand answer. It's kind of an all of life discipleship. And in terms of a husband leading a wife in an Ephesians five twenty two to thirty three way, it's it's in a Christ like way. So you're bringing all the virtues of Christ, uh, which are yours in union with Christ, your yours and everyone's in in who is in Christ, you're bringing those virtues to bear um, on your leadership. They're coming out in your leadership, which means that you're not simply trying to problem solve, which is what many husbands do, me included, in, in some of our moments. Sometimes that's called for and needed, and sometimes it's it's not what is most needed. You know, it, it's, as you say, a conversation. It's listening. It, it's conversing back and forth. It's, it's each person um, gleaning wisdom and being edified by the other. Uh, being a being a head of a home does not mean that you're the only one who edifies others. It means, Lord willing, that you're edified deeply by your wife. That's probably part of why you married her. And then even as your children grow up and, Lord willing, become Christians, man, you're edified by your children. They're blessing you. They're bringing things to light from Scripture and, and from sound theology and these sorts of things. So we, we've lost sense of the art of conversation in general as a society. Uh, being a sound bite, microwavable culture really helps none of us. And so, yes, part of what we're talking about here is is honestly just the recovery of meaningful conversation 
whether that's with your spouse or whether that is with your children. The same thing needs to be true with your kids. You, you, you need to have a conversation with them. That does much more to develop them than simply to, you know, offhandedly uh, give a curt answer and then move on. So much of discipleship, I'm sorry I'm going on here, but just a, qu- a quick connection. So much of discipleship is, dis- is uh, excuse me, is, is expensive and costly. You know, it's, it's not zappable. We want things to be zappable today. Uh, we all do. Uh, we're impatient by nature. If we're going to recover meaningful discipleship in any context, we have to recover a doctrine of patience as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really an important thing. I mean, the fact that the fact that we're able to sit down as mature Christian adults and have a conversation about these matters. I mean, as you say, that's countercultural. That's that's uh, yes. that's only because of the the spirit at work in our in our lives. So yes, and it's a major way that we actually witness to uh, the reality of Christian faith having dawned in our heart today, uniquely in this age. I talk about this in the book in Reenchanting Humanity. But uh, again, just conversing with somebody is nearly a revolutionary act in 2020. You know, not being in public and being buried in your phone and bumping into people. You know, as you you go um, smashing into them because you're you're buried in your phone. Just being able to talk to someone, being able to have a friendly conversation with somebody in a coffee shop or the airport or whatever that that's a big deal today. So uh, so we have lots of opportunities as Christians who pursue conversation to be a witness. Amen. Amen. How best should Christian couples help equip their children on the subject of transgenderism that their children now face every day in classrooms all over America? Yeah. Well, there are hard questions about whether children, Christian children, should go to public school and should get secular education. And I don't want to dismiss those those questions. I also don't want to suggest one neat and clean answer to those questions. Schools are created different. Uh, families have different circumstances. Children are at different maturity levels. So those are some of the things that need to be said there. I would say, though, uh, that that I'm, I'm an advocate for, at the very least, parents being very closely involved in their kids' education, whether that's homeschooling, classical schooling, Christian school, those sorts of things. And so I think Christians need to think very hard about such matters because I do think there can be a mentality where we think, well, they're fine, they go to the youth group, you know, we pray together sometimes, when in reality our kids are getting so much world on a given week, and I fear that it can overwhelm our children. Again, there is not a one-size-fits-all answer here. Uh, I'm a product of public school, and uh, I'm, in, I'm in Christian ministry by God's grace, so, so I never want to absolutize that. I do want to say we need to think very hard about this question. And if, if a child is to continue in a secular public school, let's say, or that sort of context, uh, then all the more need for us to double down and take extra seriously uh, the, the matters we were talking about earlier with regard to discipleship, family worship, family devotions, strong involvement in the local church. As the as the kids age, I do think it's a good thing for them to be around Christian peers if there is a healthy youth group, you know, led by a mature, uh, godly pastor. Uh, that could be helpful if there are Christian coaches or, or those sorts of individuals who can be a, a mentor. Uh, th- those are all things that, that will help. Fundamentally, we have to not let the culture be the one that raises our kids. We we have to take ownership for these tasks. So, for example, we have to teach our children biblical complementarity from their earliest days in appropriate fashion. We have to teach them this. And then as they get older, we have to help them process um, the fruits of paganism, the bitter fruits, and, and we have to talk through why it is that people would cross-dress and why it is that uh, two men would marry one another in their mind or two women and these sorts of things. We need great wisdom as to when we talk about these things and how much we introduce these things, but we need to fundamentally make sure that we are the ones who are who are educating our kids and, and not fundamentally the world. That in itself, Dave, if lots of fathers and mothers would, would commit to that would would be a big thing a very helpful thing yes yes i i remember uh i used to be a, a one of the jobs i had when i lived in idaho was a substitute teacher and uh, I, it was jarring that the one day this 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 was a girl she said uh now now the teacher told me um she's a boy and i'm like wow you know there, it's one thing it's one thing to have them change the the bathrooms right to be all-inclusive but it's another thing when it's on your doorstep and you have to deal with it 
Um, it, it, it was is. just, it was just really, for me, that was like, wow, that was, that was really like, I think the first time where I had to e- experience that, like, it was just so jarring. And I'm like, <laughs> it's so awkward because you're in the public school and you, you can't say anything either. So, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's buckle up time, isn't it? I mean, it's not that we didn't really need to disciple and train kids before now. That's crazy to think. It is, however, that if we haven't been taking this seriously until now, if we thought that our kids, if they were just raised in a nice, neat, clean and respectable environment and went to church once a week and we, you know, said grace before meals and we figured and then maybe we send them to a Christian college. If we thought that was enough, I think this age is painfully disabusing us of those kind of notions. So someone like me, who is no perfect father, no perfect husband, no perfect disciple maker, I am nonetheless convicted freshly and strongly uh, by the need to do everything I can while I have time to train my kids in a loving way in the Christian faith. I can't save my kids. I can't save anyone. But I need to do all I can to train them. Amen, brother. Amen. On page 179, you say transgender ideology is no neutral system. It is, pardon the expression, transpersonal. How do we as Christians help those ensnared in transgenderism, a transpersonal worldview? One of the things we need to do as believers is we need to frame transgenderism, so-called, rightly. Even in evangelical circles, in recent days, leading voices have argued that transgenderism should be seen in terms of a disability framework. Mark Yarhouse is probably the best-known voice associated with that view. In other words, that, that transgender Transgenderism is akin to a kind of fleshly problem that we have, some sort of disorder that afflicts us. There may very well be factors that lead into feelings of gender dysphoria in a person. In other words, if we are from a broken home or something like this, tragically, uh, there, there will be real fallout and chaos from that. If we don't have a strong relationship uh, with our same-sex parent, um, that can be a, a factor in these kind of instincts and inclinations. So as Christians, we're not scared of recognition of those kind of factors. We know that humanity is complex. We know that um, we're not rote beings, but there's a lot going on uh, in us. At the same time, we have to recognize that the Word of God treats these kind of issues very clearly in what I call a moral theological framework. In other words, right off the bat in in Scripture, we are introduced to God creating the man and the woman. So manhood and womanhood is God's idea, and every person is made by God to be a man or a woman. Of course, the fall is going to affect that in different ways. One of the ways the real fall of Adam and Eve affects uh, men and women is that it allows us to believe the lie that we are the opposite. So not for nothing does a text like Deuteronomy 22.5, this is in the Old Covenant law. This is thousands of years ago, prohibit cross-dressing with no comment about, you know, family background or breakdown of of the situation or anything like this. So if scripture treats cross-dressing in very strong terms, if Deuteronomy 22 in the Old Covenant law calls it abomination, and if Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, for example, calls for men and women to have different hair lengths, then we have to recognize that the scripture is teaching us in both Old and New Covenant that we glorify God by being a man or a woman in an intentional way, and conversely, whatever is going on in our heart, whatever is driving us to such behavior, if we're cross-dressing, if we're identifying as the opposite sex in any way, we may not know that is sinful ourselves. We may be being told by people all around us that that is good, that now we're, we're affirming and expressing our authentic self. We're following our heart, which our culture very much encourages us to do, and yet that is sinful in in biblical terms and in biblical theological terms. So if we frame these issues rightly, Dave, and we don't buy into a therapeutic, self-help-driven understanding of these matters, we will find much greater clarity for these kind of difficult questions. And then we're equipped, last thing I'll say here, to address real flesh and blood people who are sinners, who fell in Adam, which doesn't mean they are a victim of Adam's fall. It means that they're a criminal in Adam's fall. They're complicit in the fall. Adam does, in other words, in Genesis 
Genesis 3, a real historical fall, what you and I would have done if we're in the garden, we're not the victim of Adam, we're a co-criminal with him. Well, if we have this kind of moral theological framework for the sexes, <clears throat> and by extension for transgenderism, then we are equipped to be able to handle real flesh and blood people, call them to repentance in the name of Jesus Christ, call them to own their birth sex, and, and process that with them as much as they are able to do so. There may have been surgery or pills taken or something. There may be irreversible effects even, uh, but, but that's our fundamental calling, I would argue, in this area. Well, brother, that was, uh, that was a mouthful and very well said. So thank you. How does how does the doctrine of man properly understood in its proper theological perspective as one of the greater whole enchanting? Well, I think enchantment begins, of course, with God. Um, in other words, God is the one who is perfectly glorious and spectacular in holiness, and he decides in his infinite freedom to create the world, thus, in theological terms, showing us that we have to observe uh, what Cornelius Van Til and others have called the creator-creature distinction. So there is God and there is everything else. God is not just a lot bigger than us or something like this, uh, but God is infinitely uh, above us and fundamentally different from us and from every creature. We recognize then that creation is made by Almighty God and thus is an enchantment enchanted realm, we see the fall happening, as we've talked about, and that's where we learn that Satan disenchants the world, and especially humanity, uh, tricking us, really, tricking Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 into thinking that they will be like God. In other words, that they can jump that creator-creature divide and become essentially God. And so what happens as a result, as I have said, is that we, we fall. We fall and we gain a sin nature, and now we are destined by rights to go to hell because we are guilty before God as a result of sin. And this means then that the way back to God is through Christ. And I argue in Reenchanting Humanity that the way to be remade as every person most needs is through faith in Jesus Christ. When we are granted the gift of saving and justifying faith uh, in God's kindness, uh, and when we exercise that in confession and repentance based in the blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the grave, then we are, in a very real sense, re-enchanted. In other words, we are now being remade from one degree of glory into another in the image of Christ. So in Re-Enchanting Humanity, this book, very quickly, Dave, I, I devote a lot of pages to the image of God uh, and to how Christ is the image of God as well. And here's very quickly how I formulate that. I believe that we are fully human by virtue of being made in God's image, and I believe that we actually still are fully human and even after the fall, though we are fully depraved. I believe then that we need to be remade in the image of Christ, the true human. So the fact that Scripture refers to Christ as the image of God means that we need some kind of differentiation between who we are as the image of God and who Christ is. So the language I use, conversant with the work of G.K. Beale and others, is that we are fully human as image bearers, but that Christ is truly human. And we need to be remade in the image of Christ, the true man, which in turn means that we should not think of true humanity in term being true to yourself as that which is true humanity, but we should think of becoming sinless by the power of Christ in terms of uh, of how soteriology works itself out as becoming truly human. That's uh, that's really helpfully said. Where can people go uh, to find out more about your work online or otherwise, brother? Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at O Stran. O-S-T-R-A-C-H-A-N. And I run a center at Midwestern Seminary. I teach systematic theology here at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, love doing that. I teach at the MDiv and PhD level, supervise students in systematics, and uh, am director of the residency PhD program here. So we have a bunch of residential PhD students. That program is steadily growing by God's grace. So I supervise that. And the center, as I said, is the Center for Public Theology. So if folks want to want to check out my podcast called City of God, or they want to read articles on the kind of stuff we're talking about, they can go to cpt.mbts.edu. Uh, so those are a few few works that I'm up to. Yeah, I, I, I just want to encourage our listeners to go ahead and subscribe to the City of God podcast. It's one of my favorite podcasts. I know I've told you that, Owen. I really enjoy it. So you keep that up and, and everything else that you're doing, brother. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so just as we wrap up, do you want to give our listeners just a few takeaways on uh, maybe just uh, 
maybe one or a few of the topics that you we've talked about? Yeah, um, I, there's there's a lot that we've covered, uh, a lot we could cover, but I would simply say I, I think we need to be very careful about how we understand desires and feelings today, and there frankly isn't always a lot of theological care even in our circles about these matters. So one thought I would I would say in conclusion is simply that if it is sin to do it. It is sin to desire it. That's not the common formulation uh, in certain circles, but I believe it's biblical. In other words, in Matthew 5, 21 to 30, Jesus says that it's it's wrong, it's sin to lust after someone who is not your spouse, even if it's privately done, in the same way that it is wrong to think of vengeful, uh, angry thought, a murderous thought, about someone in your mind. So what Jesus is teaching us there, I think, is that if it's sin to do it, in other words, if it's sinful for me to go up to somebody and murder them, it's sinful for me to desire that. And that has profound implications for uh, sexual sin and for personal identity today. Uh, This kind of truth, as I tackle in Reenchanting Humanity, this kind of truth shows us, I believe, that we cannot embrace, um, for example, same-sex attraction. We can't see it as a neutral category. We can't see it primarily in psychological terms. Instead, whenever you and I feel any impulse or desire for something that is sinful, we should confess that to God, repent of it, and pray for fresh power over that uh, in in the name, uh, by the work of Christ. I think we need a return to those kind of biblical patterns of sanctification, which certainly are not unique to me. You find these kind of streams of thought in the Puritans and the Reformers and Edwards and and, uh, Ryle and Lloyd-Jones and Spurgeon, Packer and many others. But uh, I believe we need to kill sin, not merely at the level of deed, what we do. Uh, The gospel's not behaviorism, right? It's the gospel's not behavior change. We need to kill sin at the level of desire, uh, such that that sanctification is not simply a, a stopping of bad behavior but is a rewiring through the Spirit's power of our desires. That's a long-term process. That's not something that typically occurs in an afternoon. (laughs) It's a fight for all of us. It involves a lot of confession and repentance, but as Luther said, the whole of the Christian life is a life of repentance. Well said, brother. Well said. Well, um, Owen, I I just very much appreciate uh, your very careful biblical work and and the precision that you use and the clarity that uh, you use to articulate that the biblical truth is God has given you a wonderful gift, brother, and uh, I'm just thankful for you. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your ministry very much, like so many do. Mm, that's very kind, brother. Thank you. I'd like to thank Christian Focus for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to visit Christian Focus website at www.christianfocus.com to receive 15% off of the latest releases in theology, biblical studies, and reference books from Christian Focus by entering code equipping in grace, no spaces all lowercase, at checkout. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.